you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Without you, where would we be? It'd just be Chris Voss talking into the mic, which is pretty much what it is anyway when you really think about it. But we need the listeners and we need you. And you're so important. Remember, the Chris Voss Show is a family that loves you. It doesn't judge, at least not as harshly as your mother-in-law. Further show to your family, friends, and relatives. Those are the plugs, ladies and gentlemen. YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. And a big LinkedIn group. And subscribe to that newsletter, that LinkedIn newsletter. That thing is huge over there. People love that thing. There's a big 130,000 group over there. And we get to talk about all sorts of brilliant stuff. I'm being told we're going to be booking our third billionaire or he was a billionaire until he recently sold his company. I think that was a valuation, but we're, we're evidently we're booking him on the show. So the billionaire is just coming. I, I think we're just going to have a billionaire show from here on out. I don't know. We'll probably run out of episodes at that point. But uh, we have, of course, the most brilliant minds, authors, uh, thinkers on the show, and none of them are me. So that's why we have guests. <laughs> So we got smart people on. Today we have an amazing guest on the show. He is uh, here to talk to us about his latest book that comes out April 11th, 2023. I think it's about the Sticks album in 1976 called Grand Illusion. No, it's not. I'm making that up. His book is actually entitled appropriately Grand Delusion. The Rise and Fall of American Ambition in the Middle East. Stephen Simon is on the show with us today. He's going to be talking about his amazing book and some of the insight. Because uh, the one thing, you know, we always hear me say on the show, the one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. So maybe we should stop doing that because we just go round and round. Stephen Simon served on the National Security Council staff as a senior director for Middle East and North African Affairs from 2011 to 2012. He also worked on the NSC staff 1994 to 1999 on counterterrorism and Middle East policy. These assignments followed a 15-year career at the U.S. Department of State and between government assignments, he was the uh, Hazib Sabid Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Did I get that right? I don't think I did. Close enough. Hasib Sabad. In fact, we've had a few people from uh, the CFR on the show. He was an analyst for the RAND Corporation and a deputy director in International Institute for Strategic Studies. He is currently a professor at Colby College, and he is the co-author, among other books, of The Age of Sacred Terror, winner of the Arthur C. Ross Award for the best book in international relations. Welcome to the show. Stephen, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. And uh, thank you for bringing me on your show. I really appreciate it. And it's wonderful to have you. In fact, uh, I think we had the head of uh, the Council on Foreign Relations on the show, brilliant gentleman, and a few others, actually, that have been on the show from there. So uh, we love the insight that you guys bring to the show. Uh, Stephen, give us a .com or wherever on the Internet you want people to maybe get to know you a little bit better. You know, <laughs> I wish I wish I could, um, but I'm, I'm just... I'm completely out of it. I, okay. I'm divorced from social media. So, um, there you go. but I, I do have a Twitter account. Occasionally I do post. It's uh -huh. SNS underscore one, two, three, nine. There you go. You know, I, so it's, it, it, internet's pretty toxic anyway, right? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It can be toxic and, and sometimes it might be better. Like I have a bad habit of writing long posts on Facebook and I'm like, you know, I really should put some of this crap into a book and people are like, maybe you should just shut up. So there's that. So anyway, what motivated you want to write this latest book? Um, you know, uh, I didn't think that there was anything out there uh, on, on the topic there was uh, a really great book uh, by a British professor, Lawrence Friedman, called uh, Choice of Enemies. And that was really the inspiration for it. He, he just covered uh, a, a shorter period. 
uh, in uh, U.S. Uh, involvement in the Middle East, but he was really kind of a model and inspiration. And I thought, well, since uh, I've been there uh, as well as studied it as an academic, um, uh, it, 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 it's the logical thing to do would be to follow up on his book and would also be an opportunity for me to come to grips uh, with my career. Because, you know, when you're really serving in government, you're not all that reflective. I mean, you mm -hmm. don't think so much about what you're doing. Uh, you know what you've got to do uh, uh, and, and you do it. Uh, the president has a vision, whatever it is, uh, for U.S. policy. You're there at the White House. Your job is to make sure that that policy, that that vision is turned into policy and mm -hmm. ultimately into reality uh, if the government is functioning um, uh, properly. So I wanted to look back on, on what I'd done over the course of um, uh, you know, decades and make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's it. so, it's, it's an interesting insight that you're giving. Um, so give us a broad overview of the book, a 30,000 view, and then let's get into some of the details. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the book uh, really has a couple of themes. Uh, one is that U.S. policy since really the end of the Carter administration, but mostly the beginning of the Reagan administration, which is to say uh, 1981, when he was uh, inaugurated, was regulated by big ideas. Every administration came in, it had its big idea. Mm -hmm. But the thing about these big ideas is that they were essentially disconnected from reality in the region. So, you know, you had these administrations come in and they'd believe this or they'd believe that. And then they sort of apply these ideas um, uh, to a region that, you know, wouldn't recognize them, um, you know, if it bumped into these ideas, uh, you know, in a closet. I mean, they just it, it, these ideas were just they were developed and carried through in the absence of any contact with reality. Mm. Mm. So that was uh, it, that was the one thing. The second the second theme, which is related, is the degree to which each administration was impervious to voices from within the administration saying, "You know something? What you want to do is disconnected from reality." Mm -hmm. And that's the job, generally speaking, of the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. That's their job. You know, they come in and they speak uh, truth to power and they say, well, you know, you may want to do X, but, you know, that only that only works in your imagination. It's not going to work when you try to apply it on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and what struck me going through the archives and the declassified intelligence, uh, you know, information of which there's quite a lot um, uh, uh, available nowadays was how often the intelligence community called it right, but mm. had no impact on uh, the administration's desire to implement their big idea, whatever the big idea was. Mm. Um, th thirdly, um, and this, this kind of blew my mind, you know, in retrospect. I mean, I came into government at the beginning of the Reagan administration, and I had a certain you know, take on my experience uh, of, of government uh, back then. And of course, uh, I was steeped in the legend uh, of Reagan. Mm -hmm. And what, what struck me about the Reagan administration, about not the whole administration, but the White House really, was um, their conviction that the key partner for the United States in the region was Iran. Hmm. Iran was going to be the key player, and Iran was the country with which the United States had to forge a strong relationship. Hmm. That, you know, I mean, I was there, and I didn't really have that impression at the time, but the documents, um, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, make, it, uh, make it clear. Mm -hmm. So those were, uh, those were the main um, uh, big themes you know, large ideas that had nothing to do with reality. Um, uh, the, the 
the difficulty that the United States has had over decades in figuring out what to do about Iran mm -hmm. um, and with Reagan sort of pointing in one direction, but one which was never followed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, and thirdly, um, that the intelligence community uh, did, by and large, a pretty good job. They did a they did a they did a good job, but nobody mm -hmm. listened. You know, I I've always been enthralled with um, the, what the U.S. government, U.S. government policy, and what they do. As as a very young boy. I tripped across my mother's copy of uh, 1,000 Days, I think by Schlesinger, uh, about the John F. Kennedy administration. Oh. And, and, and he, he detailed in there, I might have his name wrong, he detailed in there, you know, w what the Kennedy administration went through, a, a bit of the deception or, or what was apparent deception by, uh, I believe, the CIA, you know, in the Bay of Pigs and how he dealt with that. And, of course, how, how he used that data to process and, and uh and 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 to deal with the crisis, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and ever since then, it's always been really interesting to me. You know, we had an author on yesterday who we we talked about uh, Nigeria and the civil war that it went through and the impact on his family. But part of that was the imperialism of the United Kingdom uh, and American stance. And you know, looking through history of how American presidents and American administrations have try to put their fingers on the scale from everything from CIA assassinations to, you know, us mucking up governments, Iran, of course, you know, how we, how, you know, the, the Shah of Iran and, and how we tried to game our support there, Cuba as well. And it's, it's interesting to me, the process of what goes through that. And so in your book, you cover 40 years of us mucking about, I'm going to use the word mucking about, um, with trying to make that work. And one thing that's always <laughs> interesting to me is, as you mentioned, you know, we have this the, the huge establishment of, of these uh, U.S. ambassadors, that, you know, we've had uh, on the show, uh, we've had um, uh, people that have worked in the government that uh, they have a lo very long, broad policy because they're there. And these presidents' administrations sometimes come in for four or eight years and even the intelligence community knows that, you know, hey, these guys are just the, the show of the week, um, if you will. And, and you know, they come in and one person does another and another does another. And how many presidents do you outline and, and go through the process in the book and kind of analyze our, our American impression, as you say, in the Middle East? Uh, well, I start with uh, Jimmy Carter, the end of his administration, and then uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, mm -hmm. uh, George W. Bush, uh, Barack Obama, uh, uh, Donald Trump, and of course, um, uh, Joe, Joe Biden. So mm -hmm. quite a big run of different administrations. Yeah. And is, is, what, do you, what do you feel... I mean, this is kind of a big, giant question. It might be more complex than than the simple answer. But is is there is part of our problem in our American sort of ambition is is that asshole Americanist sort of ideal that we are that we're the best thinkers of whatever you know? Like I mentioned, the John F. Kennedy administration it brought it brought the college people in, and the people were trying to manage a a, a, a war from some sort of college thing that you could. You know, the, somehow there was some sort of logical business decisions you can make in a war that would, would make some sort of edge or difference, and I, I think it backfired. Is the is the summation? What what do we? Why do we have this grand illusion? Because you've titled the book that. What does that refer to? Yeah. So, uh, it it stems from a couple of things. Uh, one is that in the aftermath of World War II. The United States um, had uh, what one scholar called a preponderance of power. Mm. Okay. The United States was just so powerful relative to all other countries. I just name them, clump them together. It just nobody separately or in combination was remotely as powerful you know, as the United States. And, uh, you know, the generation that grew up in that era, let's say the boomers, mm -hmm. um, you know, they they absorbed 
you know, this sense that the United States had a preponderance of power and mm -hmm. could do whatever it wanted. And, and there wasn't anyone who could seriously challenge it. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing, the second thing was Vietnam. Because, you know, Vietnam appeared to challenge this view that the United States did have a preponderance of power. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. fought that war, um, you know, from the early 60s through the early 1970s. Uh, we suffered almost 60,000 um, KIA, you know, killed, killed in action. Mm -hmm. uh, we bombed, uh, you know, North Vietnam to a fairly well. We probably killed a million North Vietnamese. And yet we lost. We left Vietnam with our tail between our legs. So, you know, the generation that you know, my book talks about tries to reconcile these two facts the preponderance of power that they were led to believe the United States possessed on the one hand, and this defeat that they suffered in Vietnam on the other, which was a, a, a traumatizing event in American history. Yeah. So they tried to reconcile these, these, these two ideas and the way they did it um, was, uh, was, by, was by pursuing two goals. The one was to erase the memory and the shame of Vietnam and show that the United States could be a power overseas and truly reflect its ability to create reality mm -hmm. despite the disappointing aberration of Vietnam, mm -hmm. that, they, that they could do it. And uh, this was this was a driving motivation uh, for this uh, for this generation, and it led to a number of wars in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I mean, but really, before Reagan, uh, in uh, and even and, and especially during Vietnam, you know, the United States didn't want to do anything in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The British were still a power in the Middle East, and they could sort of deal with security problems. They didn't really have to worry about access to oil because, you know, the British were in the Persian Gulf and they would block uh, the Soviets from somehow materializing the Middle East and stealing uh, and stealing our oil. Mm -hmm. The United States was so averse uh, to action in the Middle East during this period that even in the June 1967 war, when all these Arab countries ganged up on Israel and Israel preempted um, uh, in a devastating attack that essentially reshaped uh, that part of the Middle East, the, the Johnson administration, the Lyndon Johnson administration, had a chance to intervene and, and stop the war from even starting. Mm -hmm. But they didn't really want to do it because they were just, they weren't in the habit of intervening in the Middle East and they had other more important things to do in their view, which among other things was fighting this war in Vietnam. So, you know, uh, the United States just, they didn't think in terms of intervention, but all that, all that changed with the Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979 and then the accession of the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and almost just as soon as they came into office, the Reagan administration launched uh, an incursion, a U.S. incursion into Lebanon, yeah. which turned out, you know, disastrously. Mm -hmm. But as disastrously as that intervention played out, it didn't it didn't seem to contradict in the minds of this new generation of policymakers the conviction that the United States could do whatever it wanted um, mm -hmm. in the Middle East. So anyway, I think that's where it that's where it really comes from. There you go. And so you walk through Reagan. And, and all the different presidents since that have tried to, you know, been, been the people that, you know, hey, we're going to bring peace to the Middle East. I mean, I've been hearing that for 40 years, and it's it's kind of become, 
uh, almost slapstick or, or comedic because you're like, oh, yeah, you're going to solve the Middle East problem. You know, up until uh, Donald Trump and other places, you know, you saw Bill Clinton had that famous Israeli-Palestinian uh, moment on the lawn where they got everybody to shake hands with the uh, with everybody. Um, and it, it's it's really interesting how we just keep going back to that. Is the large part of your book uh, cover, you know, George W. Bush, the incursion into uh, taking Iraq in in a in a bit of war of uh you know some people call us call us him being imperialistic when we do that or or empire building um i know there was i know in the uh it, it seems to me and i'm i'm i can't remember the names but there were certain people that traced through a lot of these administrations especially the republican ones that had I know during the George Bush administration, the W. Bush administration, I believe there was actually a document of of empire building. I think it was called, and I believe some of the some of the specters of those people behind the document, you know, Rumsfeld and other people. Uh, and I'm thinking of another name. Um, they they have gone through many of these administrations. Uh, you, you look at. Uh, Oh, who's the gen- uh, gentleman uh, with the mustache? Uh, in fact, we famously joked with uh, Dr. Richard Haas, who came on the show, about uh, the mustache. And and he, he was actually the, the proponent between, you know, he always wants to go to war with Iran. It, was, there, was there truth to some of these documents and some of these proponents that went through administration that consulted with the presidents that constantly have this, this attachment or... Um, issue with trying to empire build in the middle east and you know bring sort of an american imperialism to it yeah so um you know imperialism is a loaded word so <laughs> i you know i just i just avoid it because it gets people's hackles up you yeah. know one way or another so um uh in and you know there's this debate over so what's actually imperialism I don't know. I, and that's those are deep waters. No reason for us to wade in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but for sure, for sure, um, there were two U.S. interests uh, in the Middle East that drove um, American uh, involvement, certainly in the years from 1980 virtually to the present. Mm-hmm. And the two interests were oil. OK, mm-hmm. everybody. Everybody kind of knows that, um, but you really got to stop and think about it. I mean, the, 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 you know, when the U.S. Uh, declared its interest in uh, in Persian Gulf oil, it really needed that oil not for itself, not for the United States, but it needed it for the Europeans who were seeking to rebuild after World War II. Mm-hmm. And the idea was, well... You know, if the Europeans didn't have plenty of cheap oil and a reliable supply of it to rebuild, then Western Europe would fall victim to communism. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the, the, the importance of Persian Gulf oil was that it underpinned the Western position in the Cold War. Mm-hmm. And so that was existential. People thought that that was just you know, incredibly important. It didn't get more urgent than that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the other interest was Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Israel was established in 1948, um, uh, you know, in the wake of World War II and these horrible, you know, the, the, the horrible Holocaust and the, uh, the attempt by the Germans to uh, erase the Jewish people in Europe. There were a lot of, you know, uh, Jews who managed to escape um, uh, Europe or who, you know, Hitler didn't get a chance to kill uh, mm-hmm. before, uh, before Germany lost the war. They needed a place to go. Uh, and, and frankly, neither the United States nor Britain wanted to let them in to their respective countries. So mm-hmm. it made sense um, uh, to send them to Palestine, which is where the, you know, the Jewish survivors seemed to want to go. Um, and and then it became uh, a responsibility uh, for the United States to safeguard uh, this new state and see that it survived against against the odds in a very hostile uh, region. So two big interests. These were these were strongly 
um, held interest. In the, in the case of Israel, it was supported by uh, a strong domestic constituency. So it was a domestic political issue as much as it was a foreign policy issue. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the oil side of things, uh, it was a profound economic concern. So even after, uh, you know, the Soviet, you know, venture in the Middle East dissolved and there was no longer any conceivable threat to uh, oil in, the, in Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates, mm -hmm. oil was still really important because it meant that the price of oil meant the difference between uh, a recession and a, and a thriving economy. Mm -hmm. So it was hugely important. And because there was so much money involved, these relationships with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates uh, and, and other oil producers threw off a lot of cash. Yeah. So you got everybody from uh, members of Congress to lobbyists to big donors uh, uh, to political candidates in the United States. They all uh, thrived on the cash that the U.S.-Saudi relationship just sort of tossed, tossed off in great quantities. And that solidified, you know, this perception uh, in Washington that uh, Saudi Arabia was, was just really important to U.S. interests. So you had those two things, you know, driving uh, U.S. intervention. Now, was this imperialism? Was it not imperialism? Who knows, you know? Empire but it was, building. It, it, but it was... There, there, there. Maybe there was, maybe there was a bit of that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually. And and the United States wound up acting uh, as though it were an empire mm -hmm. by intervening militarily in very significant ways. One in 1991, uh, and the other in 2003, and the, the those interventions were both launched by somebody named Bush. <laughs> So, you know, um, and, and, you know, the, and they were both justified by grand ideas, mm -hmm. okay, by this big idea that people, that the administration uh, carried around uh, in, in front of them uh, and wherever they went. Uh, and in the, the way the George W. Bush administration expressed it, it was the new world order. Mm -hmm. And in the New World Order, people played by the rules. Bad countries didn't invade nice countries. Big countries didn't exploit small countries. In other words, all the things the United States actually did over the years. <laughs> um, you know, in the New World Order, that would not happen. And the United States was going to be the guarantor of this New World Order. The way that was reframed under Bush in 2003 was, well, the United States was acting on behalf of the international community, uh, and the United States was seeking to um, uh, make a gift of democracy to the Arabs in the region who were thirsting for it. And if the United States had to kill 100,000 Arabs, you know, to make this work, well, you know, surely if you asked all those uh, Arabs, uh, assuming you could communicate uh, with them in the next world, uh, you know, they would tell you, hey, I was glad to give my life, you know, so that uh, there could be democracy in Iraq. But, but the wars were justified by these grand themes, and they were grand themes that, that didn't really relate very much. Uh, to to realities uh, in in the region and the two wars are connected mm -hmm. because you know the, the first war which was launched to get Iraq out of Kuwait Iraq had invaded Kuwait this small country mm -hmm. just um, uh, south of it to steal Kuwait's oil for a lot of reasons anyway they felt they felt they were entitled to it so they just wanted to go and take it the United States yeah. launched a to kick the Kuwaitis, to kick the Iraqis out of Kuwait. But they didn't finish the job. Yeah. And they left Saddam Hussein, who ran Iraq, with a huge army. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that created problems because the United States wanted Iraq to comply with various rules and regulations, you know, 
um, and, you know, after that war. But there were the kinds of rules and regulations that you could only enforce if you occupied a country and had a big army there. Mm-hmm. But we weren't occupying it and we didn't have a big army there. So the situation went unresolved until Bush's son became president um, and deranged by 9-11, uh, decided to take it out um, uh, on, on Iraq. But Iraq would not have been in the crosshairs in the second Bush administration if it hadn't have been attacked by a previous Bush administration. There you go. And you talk about that in the book, about how uh, George W. Bush has stated uh, repeatedly that he was not going to invade Iraq, but they'd already prepared for war. In fact, there's the famous uh, the, the famous thing where Colin Powell goes before the UN committee and, and claims that they do have proof of WMDs and, and they're just faking it. Um, I don't know if he was aware of that at the time or if he believed whatever sort of intelligence he was fed. Yeah, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, arrogance that we have uh, as Americans. And I believe, did, the, the, did some of that doctrine that you're talking about kind of give us this sort of attitude that we were the police state to the world that was our job to police and, and enforce, you know, world order, as it were? Well, Yeah. And we, the United States had two powerful weapons, it believed, um, uh, to control things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one was this enormous military establishment. I mean, truly colossal. And the other uh, was a reserve currency, the dollar. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the global economy was structured around the dollar. Mm-hmm. You know, if you weren't working in dollars, well, you know, that was that was too bad because you couldn't do any serious transactions. Mm -hmm. And if you were working in dollars, all those transactions ran through the, you know, the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank in uh, uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So between control of a global currency and a and a preponderance of military power. Mm-hmm. Uh, the United States had tremendous tools, but at the end of the day, they proved to be a delusion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because uh, the wars that the United States fought in the Middle East were lost, and <laughs> its control, um, you know, over currency, especially in the oil trade. Uh, was never sufficient to force Iran to sign an agreement on nuclear weapons that it didn't want to sign. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you've got these fantastic capabilities, which seem to be the biggest ever in the history of recorded time. Um, But you still couldn't get your way. Yeah. And, and, yeah, let me ask you this because this is important. I don't know if you talk about it in the book, but there's been a lot of discussion that part of the reason for the Iraq war was Saddam threatened to or was was taking uh, oil, uh, his oil, off of the dollar. And and you mentioned before that's a big power for us. That's kind of a topic that's come up recently because right now, once again, and I believe China and Russia have been at this for years, but China, Russia, Iran, and uh, <laughs> are are trying to establish a new denomination that that can take you know to can replace the dollar as the as the you know the thing that everything is bought and traded in the world especially oil is there any truth to that with the iraqi war and the george bush administration that one of the big pushes for or maybe it was the original uh father uh george bush's administration that the threat that saddam is going to take his oil off of the dollar that, that was one of the reasons we evaded that, uh, you know, that might be true. I'm not familiar with it. Um, it, but it was the era in which the U S weaponized the dollar mm-hmm. and people warned at the time that, you know, there's a reason the dollar is a reserve currency. Mm -hmm. And the one is that, well, there's nobody who doubts the staying power of the United States. 
you know, and its political institutions. So already that confers on the dollar, you know, a huge credibility. Mm -hmm. And the other is that, you know, the dollar is just that. It's, it's a currency that enables commerce and transactions to proceed. And the United States understands that the desirability of the dollar is not just owing to the stability of the United States, but it owes to the understanding of the United States that you don't mess with currency. And it's this latter consideration that's become really problematic, you know, for the dollar. And that's mm -hmm. given rise to this Russian, Chinese, Iranian, um, you know, cabal uh, to try and establish uh, their own currencies, whether it's, um, you know, the, the renminbi, you know, the, the Chinese um, uh, unit of currency is looking pretty good. Uh, in this respect now, because when people want, want to do transactions, they don't have to worry that suddenly their dollar is going to become toxic. Yeah. Either because they're doing business with a country or an individual that's been sanctioned by the United States, or you yourself have been sanctioned by the United States. So, you know, your currency essentially becomes worthless for serious transactions. And we've seen that tool used as a weapon now in modern warfare, technically through banking with like with the the, the war in the Ukraine uh, with Russia, you know, and how they've tried to isolate its ability to trade and, and do money. What, what do you hope people come away from in reading your book? Because it's, it's quite the it's quite the book and you're covering a lot of ground. Um, what do you hope people come away from in the book and and maybe discover? Okay, that's the, I suppose that's the big question, Chris. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, several things. Um, the first is that, uh, you know, administration after administration is, um, you know, besotted with, you know, various delusions that drive policy. And, you know, a lot of these delusions are they they are deluded precisely because they don't have much connection to realities on the ground. But they're just linked to how policymakers policymakers think about what the world should be like. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing wrong with that per se. But if you lose sight of what the world is like, um, then uh, then you've got a problem. And that's been a problem for the United States. Um, in the entire period, just about the entire period that the, that the book covers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that in entertaining uh, and pursuing um, uh, policies based on these delusions, successive administrations have been quite impervious to evidence to the contrary that's presented to policymakers from within each administration. So it's not necessarily external criticism, but I mean, there are those within each administration whose job it is to deal in a, in a serious and undiluted way with reality. It's their job, you know, to do that and present that to policymakers. Those people are uh, more often ignored uh, than not. The second um, is that, you know, we have this, terrible relationship with Iran. And it's been a problem uh, for the United States since, um, you know, the moment the book begins. Mm -hmm. And and you had, in fact, the Reagan administration, and this has been in the news just recently, um, uh, you know, by the way, the Reagan administration started out even before the election by colluding with the Iranians to hold on to American hostages until Reagan was elected and inaugurated as a way to jam the, his opponent's campaign, Jimmy Carter's campaign. And then, and then after that, 
uh, Reagan continued to sell weapons uh, to Iran. Um, uh, and then and then in his the end of his first term, the beginning of his second term, he entered into uh, a secret deal with the Iranians to supply the Iranians with weapons. And and he didn't he didn't do that accidentally. And we know from documents that are you know, available for scholars and others uh, to see that um, members of the administration argued forcefully that if you look at Iran, you know, the size of their population, the quality of its education, um, the fact that, among other things, it's not Arab um, uh, and, and, and so forth. It was it was the logical ally for the United States. Wow. And um, and ever since then, in each administration, you know, it, the president either comes in wanting to slap the Iranians around and then and then leaves leaves office um, uh, wanting to hug them or, you know, the president comes in wanting to hug Iran and leaves office, you know, just wanting to, <laughs> to kick them in the shins mm-hmm. Um you know, so that's been a very vexing thing, and it's still very vexing now. So that's another theme. The United States has never figured out how to deal uh, with Iran. And uh, third is this infatuation with military force. Mm-hmm. That seems to be diminishing uh, right now, at least with respect uh, to the Middle East. But the infatuation with military force was really something, certainly in, in my time in government and the history of the period just shows it. And, and, and military doctrines like shock and awe could intoxicate policymakers and, and cause them to think that the United States could do like amazing things and, uh, and, and automatically uh, succeed. Lastly, um, you know, I'd say going back to the two main drivers for U.S. policy in the period covered by the book, Israel and, and oil, you mm-hmm. know, basically. Um, the United States, I think what the book tries to show is that the United States has accomplished its objectives with respect to Israel mm-hmm. and Saudi Arabia. <laughs> You know, Israel is a country whose existence no one in their right mind would challenge Mm -hmm. right now. Militarily, it's the strongest country, you know, in the Middle East. Uh, And it's nuclear armed. Mm -hmm. Um, It's it's not the vulnerable country it was after World War II that the United States had to protect. Um, And. One can see how Israel, um, uh, feeling uh, secure um, and and wealthy uh, at this stage, feels free to um, uh, diss the United States because Israel doesn't need the United States anymore, or at least Mm -hmm. in their perception, they don't need the United States anymore. So they're happier, um, you know, dealing with the United States closely when there's a Republican administration because the the, the values uh, coincide. Uh, but otherwise, you know, the United States, they could they could take it or leave it. Mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia is a country with no natural predators. It's incredibly rich. And it's now carving out its own path. Mm-hmm. You know, seeking um, uh, stronger relationships with countries that are adversaries of the United States. Yeah. Ten years yeah. ago, you know, that would have been completely unthinkable. Mm-hmm. But they wouldn't be in a position to do that had the United States not succeeded in incubating Saudi Arabia and keeping it safe during the years when it was arguably uh, vulnerable. And I think. You know, it, this is like the empty nest syndrome, Chris. Yeah. You know, that the chicks have fledged and, and the United States needs to accept the fact, you know, that, uh, you know, Israel and Saudi Arabia are not, uh, you know, the little kids who are hanging around the wrong crowd in the schoolyard and need to be controlled or disciplined. But they are, 
they're just following their own their own star uh, now. So, um, you know, that's that's what you get for succeeding. <laughs> it, and it, it, it's interesting the arrogance of our um, American foreign policy. And like I like like I said, the first book I ever read was uh, not 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 the first book I ever read, but the first real. Uh, sort of administrative policy book that I read was 1000 days. And it was interesting to me to see, you know, how a president deals with the intelligence community <clears throat> at that time, the CIA doing all sorts of stuff that the CIA does. And, and, and it was interesting to me, the play of how, as, as a country, we've tried to put our thumb on so many different scales and we've tried to put, you know, in this, in this sort of incitement of, well, you know, democracy, the shining beacon on the hill, which is a favorite phrase uh, among the Reagan administration and the, the, you know, trying to put our thumbs on the scales and you see the sort of crises that we created in Cuba, in, in South America, um, there was the famous massacre uh, uh, of the administration uh, funneling guns and stuff. In the Reagan administration funneling guns into was it Ecuador? Um, but you know, the, the, there was all sorts of problems in the south in in the South America that we did there, uh, genocide in Guatemala. You know, all sorts of different things that we were trying to muck about with our thing. Uh, you know, even when you look at uh, Saddam Hussein, I mean, we built and funded that guy. Uh, and then we get bit in the butt. Same thing with what you mentioned with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, evidently, they're one of the people who may be, it's speculated, may be involved in this new scheme to try and overthrow the dollar as the predominant uh, use of purchasing power and oil in, in the world. Um, you know, all the different things that we've done that just have, you know, we, we've tried to do this this sort of, idealistic sort of pledge that uh, you know oh the iraqis will greet us as liberators um you know and and no one seemed to understand in the w bush administration that saddam hussein was the only thing keeping you know the factions of iraq from from going at each other and creating a whole civil war um and it's always been interesting to me how you know we seem to almost create these problems over these over these years by mucking about and trying to you know be the smart guy in the room and we actually end up causing problems or like 9-11 getting getting uh, attacked and destroyed and then drawn into an even bigger conflict that you know i mean when you look at how we pulled out of afghanistan recently um and and you you know we we had we had soldiers that wrote books on the war that were sitting there going what the hell did we do all that for why did we why do we lose our people? Why did I fight this war for, you know, this ugly <laughs> ending that was almost like Saigon, you know, that helicopter out of Saigon. So it's interesting. And I think it's important that books like yours highlight this so that we kind of have an understanding and maybe we come out of the atmosphere with this, you know, this asshole American <laughs> deal that somehow we're, we're the, we're the brilliant people in the room with the answers to everything. Or maybe we are. I don't know. <laughs> well, we certainly have the grand delusions. There you go. There you go. And hence the title of the book. Uh, anything more you want to tease on the book before we go? Because we could probably spend another 40 years talking about these uh, concepts. I think, uh, Chris, I think we hit, the, uh, we hit the high points. I would just mm -hmm. add that it looks, it looked as though in the, in the, Obama's second term and onward, the fever had broken. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obama came into office also with a grand delusion. And, and it was not unlike the preceding grand delusions of previous administrations. This one was that the United States um, uh, could could also impose democracy on the Middle East because we had the Arab Spring, you recall, that was during uh, Obama's first term and there was turbulence in, um, uh, in especially in Tunisia, Syria, Egypt, Egypt um, yeah. uh, Jordan, and Bahrain and, and, and so forth, all these uh, smaller countries. And the United States uh, intervened in Libya in a, in, a, in a fairly big way. And that turned into... Um, what uh, what Obama ultimately called a shit show. 
Um, it was, you know, and, and he, but, you know, Obama kind of looked at what happened in, in Libya and sort of said, well, we're not doing that again. You know, <laughs> we're not, we're not doing that again. And then you look and, at the result then, of that. You know, you look with Syria. Oh, the, well, yeah. And then, well, you know, o Obama at first was not inclined to get involved in Syria. Hmm. And there's still this perception uh, out there that the United States remained uninvolved. But he he was convinced um, by... <coughs> By David uh, Petraeus in the short time that uh, that Petraeus was heading the CIA uh, during uh, during Obama's first term uh, to uh, launch a major effort to arm and train the so-called moderate opposition mm -hmm. to uh, uh, to the Syrian dictator um, uh, Bashar Assad, and that was. Uh, that turned out to be one of the largest such operations that the United States had had launched ever. As we can see by looking at the newspaper every day, uh, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, you know, Assad is still there. Um, and uh, the United States is reduced to, uh, you know, 900 uh, uh, men and women in uniform uh, in in uh, in eastern Syria. Um, basically, you know, protecting the Kurds and the and the oil wells there, and that's sort of about about it. But uh, but I doubt that um, uh, that Obama, if you asked him today, uh, well, was that a good idea? You know, to launch that huge arm and train uh, effort in Syria, and he'd probably say, "Nah, not not really." That. Mm -hmm what it did was drag out a bloody civil war mm -hmm. uh, in ways that certainly didn't further uh, U.S. interest, um, but added, you know, to the vast toll of the war um, that that has been paid by the by the Syrian people. Yeah. But anyway, if you look at if you look at Obama's second term, he's got one, you know, big uh, he's got one signature uh, policy program in the Middle East, and that's bringing Iran to the table to get control of its nuclear program. And uh, he succeeded in doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and many people doubted that he could, but he did. And it was a it was a good agreement. And mm -hmm. the uh, Iranians were abiding by it until, you know, Donald Trump um, walked away from it. Yeah. So. But but that gets us to Donald Trump, who 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 was mostly in non-intervention mode, mm -hmm. um, and 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 now you know we look at Joe Biden and we see uh, more or less the same reluctance to get involved in the Middle East, and this mm -hmm. was before Ukraine, okay, and now with with the Ukraine thing going on and tensions with China, you could really see why the administration would be distracted from the Middle East. But even even before those um, uh, huge developments uh, unfolded, um, Biden was pretty reluctant, you know, to put skin in any Middle Eastern game. So mm -hmm. anyway, it uh, what I'm saying here really is that Perhaps the fever has broken and this age of intervention, the age of grand delusion is coming to an end. Yeah. And, and, and that would be a good thing. Yeah. The interest to me too is, is it, and like I say, from, from the moment I read 1000 days, seeing the chessboard of how things play out. Like for example, one of the things that constrained Obama was uh, a public perception that we're tired of wars, we're tired of this Iraq thing, and we're we're just over it. Stop it! Quit getting into new things. And so he had that pressure on him. But then you see, you know, we just had an author on earlier this week that that wrote about the migrant crisis in 2015. You see how that shaped geopolitical nations that dealt with all these immigrants that came out of Syria and moved the country very or countries, especially in Europe and here in America, very dangerously close to fascism and authoritarianism and very right wingish 
sort of push because of this, you know, the racism of immigration and, and other things in dealing with that. You know, and we, we do this huge curve and arc as, as a country politically to where, you know, we have more right wing figures getting getting uh, elected, you know, and, and uh, kind of the rise of a territorium between uh, Brazil, uh, Europe and uh, all these sort of things where now, you know, we're dealing with the, the affront of fascism. And so it's interesting to me how all of the public policy or the, the foreign policy that we do in America has these whole sort of chessboard sort of come arounds. And so that's why I think it's important people read your book and, and understand how, you know, all these things affect. And I read one time, or I, I think I, someone said one time, that one of the challenges with U.S. administrations is when they come in, there's kind of this, they feel that they have a mandate, that they've been ordained by the voters to have this mandate and, and that they are this, now the smartest kids in the room and they're going to fix it all. And they very quickly come slamming against reality. I don't know if you find that that's a, a true analogy, but I heard someone say it once. You know, it's, it's, it's very true. And I've been through a number of, of these transitions and um, both as a, as a civil servant, you know, a career government person and also a political appointee. And, um, uh, you know, of course, the new administration comes in and they do think um, they know better than the outgoing administration and that one of the things they need to do is clean up the mess that's been created by the guys and gals who are on their way out. I think that's, that, that's a natural inclination and it's true of Republicans and Democrats um, it's just seems to be, uh, baked into the pie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And I love these discussions and they're insightful and, and hopefully, you know, I mean, I say this continuously as a quote of mine, the one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history and uh, thereby we go round and round. So it's important that we learn from our history and that we, we kind of, uh, I don't know, try and do better, whatever that means. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Uh, give us your dot coms or I think it was a Twitter handle that you use that maybe that people can go check you out on the interwebs. You bet. Uh, get, go ahead. Yep. SNS underscore one, two, three, nine. There you on go. Twitter. There you go. And uh, order up the book, folks, wherever fine books are sold. Learn about your history because it's important, of course, as a voting block is people who elect the administrations and and have an influence of public uh, public perception and public uh, desires for what goes on in the middle east you know this is this is stuff we need to know and understand because you know we're the ones who ultimately vote to put these people in office or have the book wherever fine books are sold the grand delusion or i'm sorry let me recut that grand delusion the rise and fall of American Ambition in the Middle East by Stephen Simon, available uh, uh, April 11th, 2023. Thanks so much for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss, youtube.com, for Chess Chris Foss, and all the other places you can find on the interwebs. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.